All right, thank you so much for joining us for our last panel of the day. I just want to make one announcement, which is, if you don't know this already, CSGS has a new podcast series. And our first podcast is now set up in the foyer, which is over there. Um, you can listen to it. And the student producers of the podcast series will be at the reception and would love to talk to you. Student producers, would you like to raise your hand so people can see you? Here's a student producer, student producer. Um, so if you would like to be interviewed for the podcast during the reception, I think that would be something that would be possible and very exciting for all of us. So, so thank you so much again for joining us for our last panel. We will have a reception after this, and I hope you can all stay. Uh, I'm Kristen Schilt from the sociology department. And this has been a really interesting conference for me. So I came in uh, six years ago and got to inherit the, you know, all these great, I got to inherit the gender center and the race center and everything was really um, sort of set up for me and it was a great format. Um, when I interviewed here, my department of sociology told me, you know, you're probably gonna find that your intellectual home is in the gender center because we don't really have much for you. Um, <laughs> and that was true. So <laughs> as was referenced in the talk last night, my department was notorious for not reappointing Marlene Dixon, a Marxist feminist sociologist in 1969, which sparked a uh, student takeover. Um, when I came in, my department had just not tenured the other only feminist sociologist they'd ever had. Um, and so <laughs> I uh, came in from UCLA where I felt that I had complained all the time about things being you know, not you know, radical enough and then came here and thought, oh, well, I guess I didn't know how good I had it, right? Um, the Gender Center and the Race Center have really been a home for me. Um, I really feel that my work has changed a great deal from being able to be in an interdisciplinary setting and from getting to work with colleagues like Linda and Lauren and Rotana and teaching in the Gender Civ. Um, you know, and I've gotten to just see such a growth of the majors and um, the, you know, the, the gender workshop and it's just really been a great experience for me. One of the best parts of this though has come from my students, right? So my graduate students and my undergraduate students, where I feel like we're um, really working together to build a kind of community, which is something that I always wanted and thought, you know, how can you make this happen here? And it's just been, you know, incredibly exciting for me to see that take place. So the people who are on the panel today represent a group of our graduate students and undergraduates, and in one case, a soon to be postdoc. And these are all people who I have worked with in a variety of settings or hope to work with um, in a variety of settings very soon. And what is interesting to me about their work is that they're all people who are working within gender and sexuality studies and often within um, race scholarship as well and have really been a, a part of the life of the center in very central ways and are kind of thinking through questions of interdisciplinarity and also hybrid practice, right? So how do you take something that you're learning and turn it into art? How do you turn it into um, you know, some kind of other form of cultural production? But how do you also sort of gain training, particularly in this increasing era of professionalization in a discipline, but think through interdisciplinarity? And these are uh, some of the questions that I hope we are going to get to today. I've asked everybody to give a brief uh, five minute overview of their work. So we'll go through the panel in alphabetical order and then we'll just have a panel discussion and hopefully we'll open it up for questions for all of you. So I'm gonna introduce everybody now and then we will go uh, to the um, overviews of their work. So we have Jasmine Benjamin from Political Science. We have Jean Cochran from the Center of uh, the Study of Gender and Sexuality who will be graduating in less than two weeks, right? So. In two hours, we'll be graduating. Uh, we have Michael Dango, who's coming from English. Um, Annie Heffernan, political science. Jen Jackson, political science. Yay, political science. You're doing better than sociology. So. Um, and Chase Joint, who is about to finish a PhD in cinema media studies at York University and will be an incoming postdoc here at the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. So I will turn this over to Jasmine. Thank you so much. OK. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jasmine Benjamin. Um, and I am a third year in the political science department, um, specifically studying American politics. Um, and my research examines events of highly publicized black deaths. So um, broadly thinking about the deaths of like Trayvon Martin, but also taking into con also thinking about the death of Chandra Bland, um, Rakia Boyd, and sadly many other um, black people who have been victims of police and vigilante violence. Um, so as of right now in my dissertation, I'm conceptualizing these events theoretically um, through this idea of the critical racial event. 
um, and I'm still working through it a little bit, but um, so far it's something that demonstrates race-based inequality, an event that demonstrates race-based inequality, discrimination, or violence committed by an individual or um, state actor. Um, it's circulated by like major news um, media outlets. Um, it has a racialized interpretation by racially marginalized groups. Um, and then also it influences public discourse. Um, and so I took this question of trying to understand these events of highly publicized black death um, into my master's paper where I administered a survey slash experiment with about 87 participants um, using predominantly black churches in Chicago. And basically what I did was I tested for feelings of political alienation after exposure to news articles discussing police brutality. Um, I think overall my work contends with three major things. Um, first, sort of understanding um, how do we theoretically understand these events. Um, second, understanding the effect of these events, like the effect that these events have on black people who continuously have to indirectly witness um, violence through whether that's through social media or through news um, stories. And then also understanding the role that gender and sexuality play in how much attention these public these how much attention and publicity these events receive. So we know that from the work of Kathy Cohen and Boundaries of Blackness, um, that when we have events that disproportionately affect the black community, folks with multiple identities, intersecting identities often get secondarily marginalized within their group. Um, and so I think gender, in terms of moving my work forward, gender and sexuality are definitely going to be things that I'm contending with um, and trying to really understand how those affect political mobilization um, and how we think about these events. So that's a very brief <laughs> overview <laughs> of what I do. So I'll go ahead and pass it that's along. <laughs> All right, Jean. Oh, uh, which microphone should I take? Thank you. Um, so I'm Jean. Uh, I'm an undergraduate, and I'm 22 years old. So you should like take my description of my work with a huge grain of salt. Um, and to anyone watching from the future, I'm sorry, and <laughs> don't judge me. Um, but I was I was born and raised in High Park, which is kind of a big part of who I am, and has informed a lot of what I've done here. Um, I was born to a university family, so I've kind of like always been here as somewhat of an insider and somewhat of an outsider, which has been really important, um, not just studying gender and sexuality here, but also working in arts and media uh, and trying to, be, trying to be kind of like a storyteller. And I think what I've tried to do consistently over the last four years is like ask the question of how do we democratize like the tools of analysis that are being created here at any given moment because they're really powerful tools and they've like personally changed my life in so many ways. Um, but often it can, I, I kind of seem held back in some sense or like uh, stored in the institution in maybe an unjust way. Um, so I started out my first two years uh, playing in a queer punk band that was like the way I was doing that back at the time in like the classic 90s Riot girl tradition. And we made albums and music videos. Uh, we used to perform a song called I Don't Trust Straight People, uh, which is another thing you shouldn't hold me to, but it was fun. Um, and then after that, I did kind of like journalism media stuff. I did comics journalism for the Southside Weekly, which is like kind of a student paper, but not really a student paper. Um, they, it's mostly run by students, but they almost never mention the university. It's exclusively about the South Side. So it kind of had this very similar focus that I had where I like um, strongly identified as a South Sider and like politically aligned myself with the South Side as opposed to the university, but also was like undeniably tied up in that university, uh, totally inextricably, uh, in a way that makes no sense, but made for really interesting work, I thought. Uh, so I did a lot of comics about uh, covering like queer artists and events. Um, I did an awesome profile of Travis with Bia Malski. Uh, Travis is an amazing performance arts artist who's like 80 years old. Um, and Bia Malski is a recent graduate who is much younger but equally amazing. Uh, and that whole strain kind of culminated in a comic about Jane uh, that was 20 pages that I did a few years ago. And then uh, my thesis recently, which was about trans memoirs, kind of like a graphic memoir 
spinning uh, this whole question of what is uh, life writing through comics. Um, I've kind of come to another crisis, like a similar crisis that I had about music, where I'm like feeling like comics isn't enough. So my work now is kind of transitioning into um, more like digital and web-based tools. So last year, for one of Lauren Berlant's amazing classes, I made a uh, Twitter bot that automatically generates queer theory, and it's called <laughs> it's called Queer Theory Bot, and it does it better than I do. Um, and then I also did for one of Patrick Jagoda's classes, uh, who's another professor who works with the center, um, a, a game called Who Is This, which was a sci-fi um, smartphone simulator where you play a trans character trying to like navigate uh, the like dystopian near present. Um, so I've done a lot, a lot of different things, but I really feel like throughout I've been trying to answer this question um, that people I think on this panel can address way better than I of like what, what do we do about bringing the tools that we're creating here to people who like need them desperately, um, mm -hmm. but who don't really have access to expensive institutions like this one. Thank you, Michael. Hi everyone, I'm Michael. Um, so first I just wanted to echo uh, what Kristen said, framing this, that uh, when I came here four years ago and was able to just plug into the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality as my sort of first intellectual home at the University of Chicago that was really important to me and continues to be uh, a really valuable space for me. And as a fellow in the center uh, this year, I know that my work has been simultaneously accelerated and, and deepened uh, by the center. So I just really want to say thank you to um, all of the wonderful people in this room that have made so much available for me. Um, so one of the ways in which this panel was framed uh, to us was to think about maybe the intersection between some of our activist work and some of our academic work. Uh, and so that's what I kind of wanted to focus on uh, just in some of my brief comments now, uh, in part because uh, I've sometimes found it really difficult to mediate between those two spheres of my life and uh, thought it would be interesting to talk about some of the attempts to do that uh, that have been facilitated by the center uh, and also some of the challenges that continue to exist for me for that. Um, so when it comes to my more uh, sort of activisty work or maybe I would prefer to call it advocacy work, uh, I sort of have commitments in two primary communities in Chicago. Uh, on the one hand, I'm involved in the rape crisis movement uh, and advocating for survivors of sexual violence, for instance, uh, in emergency rooms, accessing the, the kinds of services and, um, and institutional supports that they need and deserve. Uh, and I'm also uh, involved in the sex worker uh, rights community in Chicago uh, and creating a network uh, that we call the Pros Network Chicago of um, sex worker friendly organizations, everything from legal services to um, addiction services, healthcare, uh, all sorts of different kinds of institutions that have signed up to provide non judgmental services uh, to sex workers. Um, and so that's, that's sort of some of my advocacy work. My academic work um, is not about sex work uh, and is uh, not even really about sexual violence. Uh, I'm in English and my dissertation is on American novels uh, from 1980 to the present. Uh, I'm a formalist, which means that uh, I'm less interested in what novels are about and more uh, interested in the kinds of shapes that narratives take, uh, the pacing of sentences, the ways in which chapters get shorter and longer. Uh, and for me, when, I, when I'm thinking about form in novels, I believe that I'm simultaneously thinking about form in other spheres of experience. So I think that the things that I learn about novelistic form are teaching me about social form, about political form, even about economic form, uh, which is to say that it's a pretty abstract uh, kind of project oftentimes where we're, uh, I'm, I'm often abstracting from the context that I'm looking at to think about patterns and gener general theories, um, all sorts of things that sometimes don't seem to have to deal with people on the ground. Uh, but I think that these two parts of my experience, uh, I've always thought of as somehow being still intimately connected. And there are ways in which that plays out um, in a sort of literal way. So for instance, you know, when I'm providing trainings to institutions in Chicago uh, about how to provide best services or sort of best practices for working with sex workers, 
Um, I have the benefit of having access to all of these academic databases uh, that cost thousands of dollars for other people to access. Um, and sometimes when you're talking to a therapist and you have a two hour training, um, they really just want some like social science data about things that uh, would be useful for them. So, you know, studies, for instance, about how uh, nurses and sex workers experience the same rates of emotional burnout um, are things that are sometimes useful to therapists uh, to have just like data and statistics about that. And so I'm able to leverage some of the, the sort of resources that I can access as an academic uh, to bring into those advocacy spaces. At the same time, the things that I think I've learned uh, about non-hierarchical groups, about um, having sort of spaces where that are accessible to people uh, from all sorts of different kinds of backgrounds and abilities um, informs, most importantly, my teaching at the, the university. And I think it's, it's the teaching that I really see as being the space that brings together some of my interest in advocacy uh, and some of my uh, academic interest as well. Um, so I'll conclude by just talking a little bit about a course that I taught last quarter um, called Theories of Sexual Violence in American Culture, uh, which was sponsored by the center here, uh, and which grew out of, uh, I TA'd the previous year, a course called Theories uh, of Gender and Sexuality with Lauren Berlant and Kristen Schilt, uh, which was transformational for me in terms of thinking about pedagogy and teaching. Uh, and I noticed in that course a lot of my students having a lot of curiosity around thinking about sexual violence in a, in a more theoretical way. And at the same time, there was lots of activism and advocacy among undergraduates in particular at the university related to Title IX, uh, related to all sorts of, uh, of um, conversations that were being had about campus climate uh, and sexual violence on campus. Um, and I think that I, I noticed in some of these conversations uh, a, a lot of excitement around mobilizing and around uh, activism for the cause, and also some suspicion or skepticism about the ways, about the goals of some of that activism on campus. Um, so a lot of the activism, for instance, was interested in, in uh, developing the right policies that a university should have in holding the university accountable to its policies uh, about how to handle Title IX proceedings and things like that. Um, and there maybe weren't as many conversations about culture or about transforming um, the social conditions that make sexual violence possible or permissible uh, in the campus, the different kinds of institutions and social spaces that contribute to that. Um, so I, I wanted to teach a course in which we were theorizing more generally about those sort of cultural conditions uh, of sexual violence and, uh, and having a space where students could uh, could think more abstractly at the same time that they were also bringing in their experiences related to this particular uh, university. Um, I'm happy to talk about that some more, but I, I just wanted to echo uh, what Roshana said in, in the previous panel, that teaching, I think, is really, for me, the space in which we get to practice some of the theories that we're simultaneously teaching, because we're interested in curating spaces that suspend for a moment the kinds of hierarchy and violence uh, that we're otherwise directly critiquing in some of our academic work. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that some of my students he are actually here as well, and, and maybe uh, we could talk some more about, uh, about teaching as a practice. Um, but I'll end there. Okay, um, I'm Annie Heffernan. I'm also a third year in political science. Um, and I also want to echo um, Michael and Kristen in saying that the center has been really instrumental for me both in changing the direction of my research and doing political science, which I would not have expected, but also in creating a home at the university. So broadly put, my research begins from the basic premise that there is a conversation to be had between political theory and feminist political theory in particular and disability studies, and that is by bridging the gap between these disciplines that we can begin to address the omissions and elisions of each. More specifically, I'm interested in how arguments for the inclusion of disabled individuals have tended to emphasize their value or worth for society and the potential dangers of this approach. Focusing on the idea of worth is connoting both economic, social, and moral value. 
I trace the way that disability has functioned as a, a potent symbol of devaluation and social exclusion to such an extent that the case for inclusion is only legible insofar as disabled people can be made into potential resources for society. So here I focus on three separate cases or sites from which to interrogate this issue. And I'm just at the beginning of my dissertation research, so this <laughs> very well could change. Um, so one is current debates within disability studies and activism regarding the permissibility of selective abortion and prenatal testing. State-sanctioned sterilization of disabled individuals and particularly how they relate to productivity. So looking at the Buck v. Bell case and the fraught relationship between employment and disability and the continued reliance and debate around sheltered workshops um, and the use of um, rules that allow employers to pay disabled people less than the minimum wage. So considering claims to disabled inclusion in these terms, I argue, helps to illuminate the ways in which the concept of citizenship has become unthinkable without recourse to a notion of social value or worth. So this has implications beyond disability studies to how we think about the inclusion of other marginalized populations. So. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. So I'm Jen Jackson. Uh, I'm a second year in political science. Um, and I'm going to start by giving like a brief background on myself because I think it helps to anchor the rest of what I have to say. So um, I grew up in Oakland, California and was socialized in such a way that I was told to deny a lot of who I was to both to myself and to others. So if you haven't noticed, I'm quite tall. Um, and being in this body and in many spaces and being queer and being in a very religious family um, with a grandmother who was a pastor who can cast out tongues, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I struggled a lot growing up with where I, where I fit um, and thinking about what my how I saw myself in terms of my gender and my sexuality and how I situated myself in terms of how I saw the rest of the world um, specifically I remember when I was younger uh, my mother told me you know don't ever let anyone call you like a nickname in public your name is Jennifer because I want you to get a job um, and uh, and you see now I go by Jen but uh, <laughs> Um, but that gives you an idea of like this kind of idea that I had to in many ways kind of deny a lot of my blackness um, and a lot of my kind of queer femininity and how I saw myself. I was told to take up less space and speak a little quieter and don't argue and, um, and I broke all those rules and uh, ended up uh, at USC, first generation college student, had no idea what I was doing but knew I wanted to do math. So I went into STEM and got an engineering degree, which gave me a whole new set of issues. Um, but I had no clue that those things were coming. Um, and even worse, it gets worse. So or better, <laughs> worse or better, however you want to look at it, because I'm here now. Um, but then I ended up at Disney, of all places, um, doing statistical work and forecasting at Disneyland and did that for five years and tried to get the white picket fence in the little nuclear family and live in Orange County. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> still found out, hey, you're still black and you're still queer, you're still a woman and you still take a lot of space. Um, so in about 2009, 2010, I started to really struggle um, in ways that were new to me politically, seeing um, what was unfolding with the murder of Trayvon Martin and how the case was unfolding, simultaneously seeing the first presidential candidate kind of rise to the White House and that intersection of political events and also not being able to speak about them publicly in many spaces that I was in because I was in Orange County, which is one of the most conservative counties in the country or probably the world or universe. Um, and also being in that particular space with the, that kind of milieu of people, um, not really being able to express my blackness in ways um, that I thought, you know, if I were able to do that, I thought it would also be kind of detrimental to my economic mobility. Again, my mom said she wanted me to get a job. Um, so I had to work through that stuff. And so I think in terms of, you know, packing up and leaving California and coming here, um, it was partly because Kathy Cohen said yes. And so when Kathy <laughs> Cohen says yes, you go. <laughs> Um, but beyond that, you know, I, I really want to say that um, in terms of how I see 
the world and my work, uh, and my activism, and my advocacy, they are all informed by all of these kind of experiences that I have had. So I always talk about Orange County, and Omi knows what I'm talking about, um, <laughs> California, I know. Um, but like, I always talk about them in a negative way, but I will honestly say that without them, I would not be where I am today, and I would not have been a 30-year-old mom of three um, figuring out that maybe I should be somewhere else, and so I'm really happy that I've come here. So I do want to also say that my work could not be possible without um, really caring and, and patient mentors like Linda Zarelli, um, like Michael Dawson, like Kathy Cohen, who have really helped me kind of figure out what this whole thing is coming from a hard sciences background and being like, who is Marx? I don't know what that means. Um, and working through that. So in my second year, I will say that I do feel a little bit like I know what people are talking about sometimes, but I don't think you'll ever know everything. So I'm always learning. And I'm learning not just from my mentors, but also from my fabulous peers, from the staff, people like Dara Epison, people like Sarah Tui, who have been answering all my emails and helping me all this time. So I want to thank all of you for that. Um, but then I'll kind of get an idea of what I actually do. So um, at present, we find ourselves in a moment where questions around invisibility and hypervisibility, self-identity and social recognition, um, bodily autonomy, and limited agency emerge almost constantly. From the political rhetoric of the presidential campaign, Trump, um, to the public contention over lavatories. It seems like the politics of public space is one that is shifting, and perhaps our views of that conversation are shifting as well. Um, these are some of the fundamental puzzles with which my research is concerned. And as a political scientist who studies at the intersections of race, gender, class, and sexuality, I seek to unearth the ways that public space limits or expands political imaginaries for individuals and groups who find themselves situated on the margins of the mainstream my dissertation research uses mixed empirical methods, including political history, critical race and gender and sexuality theory, as well as qualitative methods like interviews to investigate how and where cis and trans black women and femmes make themselves, where they find themselves and come to know themselves socially and politically. Um, I draw on the works of, of literary scholars like Zora Neale Hurston and Toni Morrison and Claudia Rankin, among others, to think about how there have been very public conversations about black women's self-making that may have been overlooked as political declarations. Um, I also want to know uh, how we can explore these conversations in terms of resistance, the resistance against erasure and invisibility. This work draws upon the autobiographical works of Harriet Ann Jacobs, Ida B. Wells, R.G. Lord, Janet Mock, and other women who articulate the processes of self-making amidst pressures from the state. And that is not to say that I believe that self-making only happens as a result of pressure from the state, but that there are key points where pressures from the state change us in ways that are both um, important um, um, and influential of our kind of next selves that, uh, that appear. Um, within these narratives, I focus specifically on the ways that gender and sexuality, like race and class, change the terrain upon which we travel towards finding, forging, and in many cases, reclaiming ourselves. I engage with Patricia Hill Collins' work on standpoint theory, Nancy Frazier's work on counterpublics, Hannah Arendt's work on the public and private divide, Sarah Haslinger's work on social constructionism of the self, and Jennifer Nash's work on the multiply marginalized groups to think about how we can move past just a narrative of, of intersectionality and start thinking also of what that means in a real lived sense. Um, and some people have laughed at me when I said, I'm going to do an experiment and I'm going to do theory at the same time in the same book. And people are going to read it. Um, <laughs> so that remains to be seen. Um, but my hope is that my work adds yet another lens through which to gain clarity on black women's political lives in the United States. Um, and also to add kind of, a, to broaden this conversation, I think it's very important for me. I have a very good friend who says that she wants her work to be something where her aunt can take it and read it and do something with it. And I think that um, for me, when I first experienced that, that was Melissa Harris Perry's work on Sister Citizen. And it was Audre Lorde. When Audre Lorde said, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. Life. And the quote was so palpable for me because I think about how many times I've thought about the idea of death and feeling like in public I often feel like part of me is dying when I'm not able to express it or live it or believe that it's actually there when I know for sure it is. Um, and so I really want to give voice to those particular um, identities and those intersections of the self and, and add conversation to how we think about what it means to make the self and that it's actually more than just my hair or my clothing or how I present myself or what my gender looks like to others. It's really about how I come to know me even in my private life if I actually am someone who has access to a private life and what that means. So 
I'm rambling on, but that's all I have. So. <laughs> Hello, my name is Chase. Thanks so much for the invitation to join you this weekend. It's really amazing to see so many faces familiar and to meet new. I would also like to say as someone with a J last name that it is a real thrill to be at the end <laughs> of a list. I don't, I don't think it's ever gonna happen again. I would like to take a moment. I'm glad it's being recorded. Who knew joint was so far away? Um, my first encounter with interdisciplinary practice in the academy came when I was an undergraduate studying theater at UCLA. And I was incredibly frustrated and feeling really constrained by the methods of teaching um, in the department at that time. And so found myself, like many radicalizing, politicized uh, undergraduates, in environments of activism and social change, and spending less and less time in the classroom and more and more time um, with people who at that time were working in environments of sexual violence, advocacy, and awareness at UCLA. And all of a sudden, I realized that some of the activist strategies that I was learning from my peers at that time started to infiltrate my art practice. And I was bringing back strategies directly into the classroom, whether I thought it was to disrupt the canon of theater or whatever I was doing at that time. But they were these small inklings, these small tools that started to amass over many years. At that time at UCLA, I also met Kristen, who was finishing her PhD. And I can attest that Kristen has always been the community maker in, in all environments of things queer and trans and institutions that might not be able to see them. So it's kind of incredible to be here. Uh, fast forward 10 years, I get an email from Kristen that is forwarding a note along from the Gray Center for Arts and Inquiry that is seeking applications for academics to pair with artists to disrupt each other's practices and disciplinary locations by approaching a shared set of questions. And so Kristen and I applied for a fellowship thinking broadly about the politics and practices of narrative construction related specifically tra to trans people and to transitioning subjects, I would say more broadly. And we've spent the, you know, the year and a half of the fellowship and now the rest of our lives continuing to engage <laughs> with these questions and being given an opportunity to really sit in the discomfort that happens when you pull out of your disciplinary location and what is made possible when you have a a space where you are allowed to not have answers to questions and where you are allowed to keep asking. Um, concurrent to my time here as a Mellon Fellow, I was working on my dissertation in Cinema and Media Studies in Toronto and negotiating the wild world of bureaucracy that is required in order to make a film alongside your dissertation writing. And so if we wanted to make this whole panel about bureaucracy, I would also be really interested <laughs> in that conversation. Um, and my most recent project that has brought me to Chicago is that I've just published a book called You Only Live Twice, which takes up my transition from female to male and my friend Mike's near death from AIDS in the 1990s as starter blocks for second lives. And we approach the project as an interdisciplinary experiment. So what does it look like to bridge gaps between life writing, which has its own traps and tropes and problems, with cultural theory and media analysis to some hopeful new ends? So thanks. I mean, one thing that's been interesting to me listening to you all on this panel is about the kind of divide between what we might consider sort of activist or political commitments and disciplinary like conventions. Um, and I think about this a lot as you know somebody who was trained as a sociologist, um, but also somebody who like had a deep commitment to feminist and queer politics, but kept those very separate. Um, that you know there was sort of my activist work and then there was my academic life and I kind of found a way to like make them work but I just didn't really say very much about it right while I was doing it um, and you know so I think a lot about those tensions particularly in this age of increasing professionalization for graduate students right where it's like the day you come in it's like how are you gonna get a job like what's the job market gonna look like like do you have your job talk ready yet you know like what's your <laughs> what's your elevator speech for you know and so I think a lot about what is this kind of professionalization doing at the same time that I do a lot of panels for grad students about professionalization. So <laughs> what is it doing to, um, you know, like what are the kinds of tensions that, you know, some of you have felt about, you know, being in a discipline and trying to do sort of disciplinary work, but also trying to find ways to kind of break that up. And I just thought maybe we could talk a little bit about those tensions. And it's open to anybody. No alphabetical order is now necessary. <laughs> so I can, I can speak to that. So um, one thing I didn't, note is that I'm the, I'm the managing editor of Black Youth Project and I've been um, 
I've been writing on race and gender and sexuality and lifeness since about 2009, 2010. And I think that um, I didn't see the ways that that intersected with my academic work until like actually other people started saying it. They're like, you do understand that this is almost like the thing you wrote the other day, right? Um, and I think that there's a lot of times where we are almost situated, I think, especially at a university like this, it's, it's just like a highly competitive university where it seems like it's almost as if the, the objective and the, the goal is, is the professional, it is the career, but we don't see the ways that so much of that is already informed by how we live our lives. And I think that, um, you know, especially for folks who's, who identify with certain marginal identities, um, that can be very difficult. So I, I mean, I think, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think that for me, what I, I think at one point, I think it was last year sometime, I just decided, I said, I gotta stop thinking that somehow I'm gonna like magically wake up tomorrow and everything I do will be this like seen as some type of mainstream, you know, new canon, you know, and, and just embrace what I'm doing because it's valid and it's important. Um, and the people who need it will find it. And the, the folks who um, support my work are here and, and appreciate it. And so I think that it can be hard because in a lot of ways, professionalism is itself a violent thing. Um, and I, 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 I don't think it's easy at all, but I do think that speci specifically having centers like this um, make that process a lot easier to, to embark upon, I would, I would say. I've, I've also been thinking lately about, um, so uh, on the one hand, like when, when we think about uh, the, the sort of difficulty of managing um, possibly diverging political and academic commitments and the, um, I mean, I know that there's just like a certain code switching, for instance, that happens when you go into different kinds of space. Um, I've also been thinking today during some of the panels about, um, I mean, just sort of owning the privilege also of being an academic and that there, there is a lot of freedom that that gives you um, in, in your work that, that I don't always feel like we have in, in some advocacy sorts of settings. So for instance, um, I feel that in academic settings, um, I have a lot of liberty to experiment uh, with different kinds of ideas and to fail in those mm -hmm. experiments, you know? like. A couple summers ago, my interest in form had me like reading the continental philosophy of mathematics for like four or five months. I really thought this was going to radically help how I understood social form. There were reasons to think this, you know, Deleuze's arguments about ideas, indifference and repetition are completely derivative of a philosopher of mathematics named Philip Lautman. So I really thought this was gonna help me and it obviously it didn't, right? Like it was, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't work out, but I, I could spend four months having the thought that it could. <laughs> and in advocacy settings, uh, sometimes it seems like the stakes are a little higher when you're trying to advocate for somebody to access resources that are being denied to them. Um, this isn't to say that activism isn't experimental and doesn't have failures, of course it does. Uh, but it like sucks more when there are those kind of blockages. Um, so I, I've been thinking a little bit today about just owning the, the sort of, on the one hand, it, it can be very challenging to feel like your academic work is disconnected from your advocacy work. Uh, it can also be very liberating that your activism isn't being held accountable or that your ac academic work isn't being held accountable to that activism in the same way. Um, so, Michael, I think what you're saying is important and um, thinking about, like for myself, that was actually a conversation that I had with a past professor of mine, um, thinking about how I could sort of navig better navigate the privilege of being an academic um, and doing work that examines communities that don't necessarily have um, access to this space. Um, and one of the things that came out of that conversation um, with the professor I was speaking with was not necessarily getting caught up in the privilege that I have, but trying to think through ways that I could um, help other folks who may not have 
access to the space gain that access mm -hmm. and and sort of further thinking about that even this morning um, something that's come up for me is trying to find a niche between like fi using the research skills that I have already and um, trying to find ways that I can volunteer for organizations or better use those skills to assist populations that are not just limited to the university space. Um, and then just to sort of go back to the original question, um, I think I've been able to best navigate my political commitments and my scholarship um, by pursuing exactly what I'm interested in. Um, like that's been the best way of just sort of focusing in on understanding this very specific thing of like indirectly, wit continuously indirectly witnessing violence and what that does. Um, for me, that's been very satisfying in being, being able to sort of combine those two things. Can I, um, yeah, I, I don't, I have very complicated feelings about this. I wanna like I dig into that, that question of like academic uh, freedom on like an undergraduate level. Mm. I think it's, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think it's definitely true. I feel totally the same way of like what an unbearable privilege in some way to like pursue interesting questions all the time. But then on the undergraduate level, there's this big complicated thing about like it's so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And for like most people, that's the primary concern is like how do you justify or, or like how do you juggle what you want to do with what you like, the financial decision that you right. just have to make mm -hmm. on your life. So I feel like that's one big question that I have, like thinking in the new directions, uh, kind of milieu of gender studies is like, how do we, how do we like navigate that gap for future under, like should interdisciplinary work always just be like a graduate thing where like, okay, you're, I mean, not that grad students are like secure at all. That's like a whole other thing. Um, but like, you know, you're, if you're a PhD student, like you're, you're getting paid sometimes and um, you have like a level, you have like a level of, of authority, but I, I feel like so, I see so many undergrads who are like so interested in this work, but like have to study engineering mm. and like they just yeah. can't do both. Mm. So like, what, I don't, what do we do for those people? Isn't it more possible though now to do both? Like that, we've been trying to make that more possible. Is it more of a mental barrier? And I talk to so many kids who, like, my parents insist that I major in economics, but I hate it. So I'm doing this, but they, but like the, the major, double majoring and minoring, is it more of a psychological barrier than it is a like literal institutional barrier? So. I don't want to hog, but I feel like you just said engineering and it triggered me. So. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. So I, I think, so I think that's a great, I, so I, I completely feel you. So I think about undergrad and I felt like I had to major in engineering. I felt like, I felt like I couldn't do social sciences because, you know, I thought, I did think in a lot of ways as a first generation college student, what are my chances? You know, I, I, I have to do the best I can here and get the best degree that will get me the best job. Um, but then there's also the social pressure at home, right? Like I remember my mom just like beaming, telling everyone, oh, my daughter's getting an engineering degree. <laughs> And whenever I mention, oh, I'm also minoring in sociology, she's like, where can you work with that, you know? <laughs> and I love my mother to death, you all. Don't tell her I said these things. She probably won't see this, hopefully. But, and she's a wonderful human being. I just love her. But I'm just saying, like, you know, in terms of thinking about the kind of indigenous kind of resources that you have in certain communities and also wanting to be able to take certain things home, mm -hmm. you know, so it is a financial concern. And, and like, at USC, I was, I was lucky enough to, to have a lot of, so, like, you know, support from the university to go there. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to go to college at all. But I did, there was a certain amount of me that said, you know, I've got to get, a, you know the degree that's gonna really have a lot of legs and in my mind it wasn't the social sciences it wasn't the humanities you know and I think that that's something and it probably is maybe easier in some cases um, for for folks now who are in undergraduate programs but then there's also well, if you do a double major how much longer is it gonna take you to get out right or um, how much energy do you have <laughs> And then we end up, I think sometimes you, the, the students then feel pressured in ways that in, it may cause them to even, I think about the young woman who dropped out of Columbia last week because she was just tired, a young black woman. She said, I just left because I just had to get away from it all. And I just think about, yes, there may be more opportunities to double major, but 
what are we really thinking about the structures of the universities that make it so tough to just maybe go and study what you want to study, right? And then what are the social implications when you actually do that? And I, I think it's a very complicated and great question. So don't say anymore that you're just an undergrad and what you say is you think of a grain of salt. But yes, I think it's important to consider in terms of thinking about how we think even about who ends up in graduate programs as well. But I think it might be also important to think about how interdisciplinarity is still an exceptional project. Like, what would it look like to de-exceptionalize the process of thinking across disciplinary lines and affording resources for that to be a more fluid movement? And I think those people, especially in undergraduate positions where you're forced to make a number of choices in order to reach a goal, um, you feel locked in very quickly, yeah. right? And because you've had to move through so many different bureaucratic means to get to the opportunity to encounter yourself in more than one place at the same time, you know, what does that mean? And I think that even at the PhD level, you know, the responsibility as is in anyone who's making new work, but is to create the legacy for your work. And so what does it mean to have the legacy of the island of misfit toys, right? You need to say <laughs> that there's actually a lot of us and, and that legacy exists beyond the bounds of the disciplinary, you know, the discipline that's gonna grant us these things. Um, and so, I mean, I think, you know, that does, since Chase is going to bring up bureaucracy uh, again, uh, I mean, I, I do think we could think through, like, what are some of the bureaucratic sort of obstacles to doing this, right? And I think some of it is, um, you know, some of the things we can change. We can make things more possible in terms of double majors or some of my students do some of their triple majoring, which just, like, makes me, like, want to be tired for them. Um, but, so you can change, like, the kind of institutional, like, curriculum. Um, but, you know, what are some of the other kinds of, like, things that would have to shift to make interdisciplinarity um, less of a kind of specialized project, right, that maybe you get it if you can major in gender and sexuality studies, which is, you know, by definition going to be interdisciplinary, um, but it's going to be harder if you're in other fields, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm curious in sort of your take on what are some of the kind of bureaucratic obstacles. Bureaucratic thing, but I have um, I've been approached by a number of undergrads wanting to do work in disability studies, and the lack of faculty is a huge thing. So, and especially with faculty who are amenable to it going on leave, that um, <laughs> uh, that no, I mean it is she's approached like ten faculty. Um, and as a result, has gone back to do an independent study on her own with another graduate student using a syllabus from a graduate student here from a couple years ago, Claire McKinney. Um, and so while there's a lot of interest, I think both within gender and sexuality studies and especially in disability studies, there really isn't a faculty presence as welcoming as the faculty is, and they've been amazingly welcoming in comparison, so I did my undergrad at Harvard, there it was completely like, this is not something you do. And in terms of gender and sexuality studies, they had no, at least at the time I was there, they had no standing faculty. So the introductory classes were taught by visiting professors. Mm -hmm. Um, and usually like well-known visiting professors. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Jack Halberstam taught, yeah. you know, intro, but um, I think, translating the willingness to do interdisciplinary work into actually having faculty yeah. that mm -hmm. can help with that. I think, so. I think on, the, um, on the staff level, there's a lot that you can do. And I think the center is a great model for that, like not just because like we're celebrating the center, um, <laughs> but also like just literally, um, like I'm thinking of my, Experiences with Sarah Tui and Tate Brazas in particular are like incredible. I, I can't believe they happened. Like, I can't believe the kind of stuff that they let me do here um, and how ridiculously permissible everyone is about uh, putting. St I came to Sarah two years ago and asked her if I could put on a rock opera in the center. And she said, as long as I like locked the door after I left, it was fine. Um, and like maybe that's not a great example for <laughs> supporting scholarly study. Um, I certainly thought there was a lot of thought behind it, uh, and it was it was 
useful. <laughs> but just that spirit that the center has constantly of like, yes, we'll do the thing that you want to do and we'll put money behind it and we'll yes. put like effort and resources and we'll acknowledge that the interdisciplinarity of it uh, matters and is, is valuable is huge. And I feel like uh, I feel like that would be interesting to see in other places. I, I feel like from the like gender studies department, there's just such an incredible willingness to to do things, but that I feel a lot of students who are in more traditional disciplines, that there's kind of pushback yeah. from there when they want to do interdisciplinary work. Um, so so I, I don't know, maybe like other, that's an interesting bureaucratic thing, I think. Can I just add on to that? I mean, since this just gets to the, the sort of importance of just having space, um, I mean, I know that one of the challenges in the English department um, in, in particular, and I think that this is shared in a lot of other departments, is that the English department, we just don't have a very like, robust public sphere, in part because we don't have like, spaces as much where students are able to just encounter each other, right? Like to just like, run into each other in a place where they're getting coffee, for instance. Um, so there, there, we need just more spaces that don't always have to be oriented to a particular project or a particular um, you know, research program where people are just like coming into contact with, with each other to have some of the conversations um, that we're having here about uh, how to direct resources in different ways or, or different challenges um, that, that students face um, from institutional pressures, from lack of funding, from all sorts of other things. Um, so if, if there was just a way of carving out more spaces within departments or within other buildings uh, that, that that sort of public sphere could be cultivated, I think that that would also go a long ways. I mean, I think these are all really interesting points because I think one thing that we're kind of getting to is, you know, we've had like two days of talking about how the center um, came into being, you know, at the same time that the race center came into being. And part of the legacy of that, you know, is this great panel and all of you in the audience, and this is wonderful, but it's also the idea that these become the places where gender and race happen and it lets everyone else off the hook, right? And so it's like a sense of like, oh, are you interested in gender? We'll go to the gender center because sociology can't help you or engineering can't help you. And you know, I think the fact that we don't have our own faculty, right? That all of us who participate, participate from a department where we have an enormous amount of other requirements um, and you know, that becomes really difficult. And I think that you know, when I think about, like, it's great to celebrate 20 years, and I'm like, but what's next? Like, what are the next 20 years, right? And I feel like the next 20 years are, like, agitating for the fact that, like, it can't be our responsibility to be the only place that's going to talk about intersectionality or race or gender even. Um, and to think about how to put pressure on the administration about, like, the faculty hires are important, right? I mean, space is important. Like, if you have, you know, 2,000 undergrads that are interested in gender and race and you have 10 faculty who are trying to supervise all their BA theses, mm -hmm. you get things like, I'm gonna go somewhere else as a faculty member where there's more institutional support, right? Which is like, not what we want, right? And so I think that, um, you know, I'm always struck with what a great community it is, but how it really is kind of like sometimes hanging by a thread, you know, in terms of who's on leave and like who's here and who has the energy to keep doing things. And, um, you know, I've been incredibly like the times in which it has started to get to me, um, you know, it's really like my undergrads and my grad students who show up for things when they're tired and like they have a million other things to do and like they come and be a community. And I think that that's something that really makes me be like, okay, I can come back at seven o'clock to an event and like show up and be there, you know, or like, you know, like Lauren and Linda and like, you know, the countless people who show up too. And, but then I also think like, but we're not enough, right? You know, and like, and that's the thing that really, um, I think going forward to think like, how do we, do this, right? Like, how do we actually make this so it's not just um, if you have the space in your schedule or the luxury to do, you know, gender and sexuality studies, you get this kind of like environment. But if you don't, then, you know, hopefully your department has someone who's interested, but maybe not, right? And so I think that those are really interesting questions. So that we could open it up to the audience. Yes. So in the first end number, sorry. In the first n number of years of the Center for Gender Studies, uh, we had, so the question was always, um, why not department and why center? And it's just worth thinking about that in, ter in bureaucratic terms. So department's main uh, desire is to reproduce themselves and like to cover their things and to get more of them and to expand themselves and so on. The center, the great thing about a center is you can always change the infrastructure within the space. 
And I think that's really what Jean has, was talking about too. And we had, um, in those days, we had a thing where we, we offered, I don't know, five or 10 grants for faculty student collaboration f uh, for two years. So reading groups and conferences and stuff like that. So you would have projects. So thinking about the relation between a project and a major is really interesting because majoring is only one of the ways you get continuity, knowledge continuity, but projects are another way. And um, so I think it's also about inventing genres for continuity that could really help think about what, you know, how to work, what's inflexible, relatively inflexible and relatively flexible in a university institution. And that also includes bringing people from the outside all the time and folding them in in the way that the, all these newer structures um, can foment. Um, I really apologize in advance for this question, but I'm wondering, um, given sort of the current environment where even uh, disciplines in the humanities and the qualitative social sciences are under attack and sort of on the defense um, from hostile legislatures and so on and so forth, how do you see, um, how opti first of all, how optimistic are you in that sort of projects of interdisciplinarity and ex an expansion of what counts as sort of um, normative mainstream scholarship can happen? And um, what are ways in which you think this project can go forward even in the face of uh, drastic budget cuts and um, hostile public attitudes of those in power? Uh, I, I mean, optimism. Um, it's the only way we can be here, in my opinion, right? I mean, this sort of integrated, cross-disciplinary, colleague-based, sitting on a table because we've only ever actually seen each other in this building. Right. Like, it, over the years, um, style of relationship, I think, keeps us all asking these questions together. And I also think, you know, learning from the leaders of Black Lives Matter right now, learning from people who are on the vanguard of trans rights, thinking about the people who are making major systemic changes and agitating in ways that are incredibly important will impact the types of agitation that we are attempting within the confines of these walls or this you know, location. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing I would add to that is um, you know, sometimes it seems like it's impossible to get what you want from the university. And I think the university is very good at making that seem like it's impossible. But I think like, you know, we're getting a trauma center and like, if you had told me five years ago that that would have been successful, like I was like, there's no way the university is going to constantly put that off, and like they're always going to be able to make this like analysis of why it's not going to make any sense, and that was pressure, right? I mean, that was like direct activist pressure. It was people from the university working with people like on the south side of Chicago and fighting for it and being inconvenient and being more than inconvenient and not giving up, right? And I think that, um, you know, I think I'm you know, maybe because I'm a sociologist, I'm optimistic about social change, right? I mean, I think it's the one thing you can count on is that things will change. And you don't always like the way it changes, but you can try to push on it and like make it go more the way that you think is gonna create more opportunities for everybody. So I think that certainly, you know, when I hear all this, you know, all this stuff about budget crunches and everything that's going on right now, I'm also like, right, but that doesn't mean you, don't give, you give up, right? Like you don't let it win. I mean, you become more inconvenient if you can, right? And noting that some of us have more possibility of being inconvenient than others, right? And I think that's important to keep in mind, too. So I think I was going to say something similar, but I think that's the exact answer. It's the, like, just saying no. Like, we're, go we're still here. We still exist. We still have these genders and sexualities and identities. Um, they won't go away just because you don't want to spend money on them, right? Um, <laughs> but I also think, I think it's a really interesting question, especially thinking about, like, the political context that we're living in right now, um, thinking about the fact that the White House has been working adamantly to now, after they were pressured from social media on My Brother's Keeper, are now now expanding all their research is the research on women and girls of color, right? right? And I think that often it feels like these kind of bureaucracies, these bureaucratic decisions, these bureaucrats who, you know, these mythological beings and these, you know, whatever color towers, I don't know, what color would a bureaucratic tower be? Gray? gray. gray. Steel gray. <laughs> so, like, you know, I think that in our minds it's just kind of this fixed um, uh, unmovable object, but the truth is it's moving, right? We're watching it move right now, and I think that, like for me, I'm incredibly optimistic. I wouldn't have picked up my entire family and moved to Chicago um, if I wasn't, and I think um, 
more and more of us are becoming optimistic because there's so many kind of new publics that are forming where we can find one another. So yes, some of us only really see each other when we're in this building. Um, but then the idea is, well, what happens when we all leave here? We're going to find one another again at a conference or when we happen to have hopefully tenure track positions um, <laughs> after we leave, right? And so I, exactly. Um, so I think, you know, I think um, it can be like, I think we all kind of go down our little spiral or rabbit hole like, oh my gosh, what do we do? why did we do this? This is so scary. Um, but the truth is like, there's a amazing work coming out of this center. We have amazing mentors who are producing like some of the like, groundbreaking theoretical work and empirical work and, and qualitative work and quantitative work. So I think that it's clear that we're making an impact on the disciplines that we, that we serve. Um, and in a lot of ways, I don't think that the bureaucracy is even strong enough to kind of erase that or wipe that out. I just don't have that much confidence in them. One, can I just say one? We are also a private institution, though, which I feel like changes. Like, I don't, the, that question feels totally different to like a uh, school facing um, budgetary cuts from like a right. state government. Um, and also, like, not even on the university level, uh, I'm like much, much less optimistic about that, that kind of thing. So, just, yeah. I just wanted to comment um, as a, once and probably future bureaucrat. Um, <laughs> once you've been a bureaucrat, it's hard to not ever be a bureaucrat again. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'll put this another way. I would not miss the opportunity to be a bureaucrat in the right situation because you can do things. So Gina and I used to say when I was directing the center, well, um, if we build it, someone will pay for it. <laughs> and that always happened. And when I was in the provost office, we had a mantra, ask forgiveness, not permission, right? So you go and you do something and somebody doesn't like it, you're like, I'm sorry. But you did it and something happened or they don't say they're, they don't ask you to, you know, so like I, bureaucracies are just people doing jobs, most of them not very well, a lot of them with great passion and commitment to doing something. Um, so anyway, like one should not be unoptimistic on that because you can do a lot of stuff. I felt like I got a lot of stuff done, but partly because you got to learn where in the system you can get what you need. But I think that I would say it's like keep building stuff because someone will figure out it's a good idea and it's always going to be slow. Your arc of change cannot be next year. It's got to be four and five years from now. I'm sorry, and that's not good for undergraduates because that means they don't see the results of their efforts. But it's also true of faculty and it's also true of graduate students. It's like, I mean, I do like think of Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a hero. She kept plugging away until she's like so tiny. She's like barely even sitting in the seat on the Supreme Court, <laughs> but like chipping away and you can just chip away, but just keep building the things. And you know, I, I'm not hopeless about that. People recognize good ideas. If you magnetize people and you magnetize students and faculty them, like you can get resources. Uh, you know, next year, no. Two years from now, maybe. You know, like it's, it's you know, just to create a black wall of like some nameless drones <laughs> It's just not effective for us in terms of thinking about what's possible. Hi, um, I have a question. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm also like a student of um, Professor Dango and Professor Schilt, and it's like just so cool to hear you all speak. Um, so in a, I'm sorry. sorry, in a kind of different direction of like uh, the kind of intersectional um, new direction approach. So I have this question, because you had mentioned like pushing beyond intersectionality. Like here at the university, um, a lot of the women of color who have like interests and stakes in studying women of color, like we, you know, come to the 20th anniversary gender celebration, we come to the 20th anniversary race center celebration. We have, you know, I am like, I have a foot in like the gender major, right? And then a foot in the race major. And then I'm also in sociology. So. I'm wondering like when we're thinking about pushing in new directions or like interdisciplinarily, um, like what is that, how do, how do you kind of imagine like, um, and even take into account, for example, like queer critical studies or like disability and all these kind of different axes of like oppression, right? Like how, um, how am I supposed to, or like how can we imagine in the future like navigating a, like the institution of, right, like the, um, 
sorry, the university, like how do we navigate the university when like you're occupying, when it's almost like, you know, you, ha you have like Kathy Cohen who comes out with just incredible work, but then I am here at the university and um, when I'm in a gender class, like I'm the person of color, right? And then when I'm in a, in a race class, like I'm the only person that says the word gender, right? So I'm wondering like, how do you imagine that changing? Oh. Do I imagine it changing? Um, you know what? I, I don't mean to be nihilistic. I don't imagine it changing much. Um, I just, for me, um, I think what I've done is I've started just living out loud in a way where I just don't care. Like, it's like, if you are concerned that I happen to also have other marginal identities, I just don't care. And I don't expect my classmates um, who maybe don't share those identities or maybe do to to see the world the way I see it. And I think that's the thing is like, I think um, when I talk about intersectionality, I struggle with the term now. I love Kimberly Crenshaw and I love the, the concept. But what I struggle with is the way that it's been co-opted to kind of distinctly identify certain mm -hmm. ways we study certain groups of people mm -hmm. and at certain times and how we look at certain identities and not others. Because there are some folks who completely believe that we should have an intersectional focus, but don't believe that trans is a thing. And it's like, how? How do you do this, right? And so I, I think for me, um, it's less about thinking about how I can get the structures or the, you know, the folks who are maybe not as amenable or um, acquainted with my work to change and more my perspective of those structures and those individuals to change. Because the truth is, um, like I said earlier, I mean, I think that the work that we do is so vitally important and is representative of a very, um, of, of mostly folks who have not have been given voice before, who have not been necessarily represented in academic work. And so if I um, get wrapped up in how, uh, you know, very, I say traditional, but we know what I mean by traditional, um, institutions and people see that work, I'm gonna end up producing the same kind of um, non-fluid, not innovative kind of, uh, of, of research. So, I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying about being the, the race person in the room and everyone looks at you and they say, like, black or something, like, oh, yeah, it's me. Or, you know, being the one woman in the room and it's like, okay, now we have to talk about women's issues. Hey, Jen, what do you think about this, you know? And, that, and I, I think, you know, it's uncomfortable. I just don't think it's going to be something that, especially at a, a PWI, um, you know, that serves, you know, typically a very type, a particular type of audience. Um, students here are from a lot of different ranges of backgrounds, but we do, we know that this is an elite university. I don't think that that will fundamentally change in those kind of circles, which is why these spaces are so important. So, I mean, again, I don't want to be nihilistic. I just don't think it's something where we can say, and I don't think we should try to be the critical mass to try and change it. Because I don't, I don't think it's fair for a critical mass of people of color or people of certain identities to then have to be the, the thing that changes it, right? I think the best thing that we can do is live our lives authentically as we are and find safe spaces and safe others who live those lives with us so that we don't have to be afraid or concerned. And it doesn't feel like we're being courageous just by sitting in a chair in class, right? I think that's a better way to maybe approach it. Um, other people may have a different perspective, but that's how I've decided to live um, on this campus in this moment of history. So. As a student, I think a lot about my citational practices. So I think about who maybe we cannot encounter the whole, right? But who in a paper or who in a film can I be reading alongside? And so who becomes visible in my work is one of the ways that I can directly impact if my work ends up on a coffee table and someone's really bored and wants to take a look at it. Like, who is the work in conversation with? And I think it's something that when we feel isolated in a classroom or singled out in a classroom, you can think about who you can put your own work in conversation with, even if the syllabus that you are um, engaging with doesn't do that work for you or doesn't assist you in that process. Small, tiny moments like that. And also, like. Oh do you feel like there's a relationship between collaboration and citational practices too? Because what you're saying now reminds me a lot of what you were saying on Monday during your book talk about like collaboration being kind of an encounter between different subjectivities and a way of like keeping your work engaged in other people. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm pretty sure it's you. Lauren Berlant. I, I mean, I'm just gonna pair, you know, the, I, I love, there's this amazing quote in Sex of the Unbearable that says, you know, the collaborative process, the dialogue destabilizes the solo authored authority and 
invites levels of pause and invites friction and invites an opportunity for new kinds of encounter, right? That I think is really theoretically and politically generative to sit in those kinds of moments. So thank you all for your really great comments and also just for being here. Um, I had a question. I mean, it's connected up with what Jen was saying, and I, I understand what you're saying, you know, in terms of finding and occupying safe spaces where you can do your work and all the rest. But as you well know, you know places like this center came into existence because people fought for it, right? And so it's through political agitation. And one of the questions I have for all of you is, how do you connect with your peers? Because I mean, the thing that's strange to me about Chicago is the really, I mean, like Kristen, I went to Berkeley, you know, for my graduate education. And I was just so used to people being politicized all the time around. I mean, a lot of crazy stuff too, right? <laughs> but I mean, really, the thing was, is that it was just, an, you know, there was, the quad was always occupied, okay, by somebody. And, <laughs> The thing that, I mean, I, it's great, but there's so little political agitation here. So, I mean, I'm not saying there's none. We know there is, but I guess what I wanna say is that even though I think we have a tone deaf, worse than tone deaf administration that probably doesn't really care what faculty think, let alone what students think, but nonetheless, I mean, without the agitation, and I think it's not just from faculty, Right? It has to be from students. So when we go back to the question of how can you get more faculty appointments, it's only going to come through, stu I mean, it has to be student and faculty agitation. That's the only thing that's going to create it. I mean, we, I mean, and faculty alone can't get it. I can guarantee you that. So, you know, with that in mind, thinking how does change come about, I'm wondering how you all just negotiate I don't know with your, you know, you come in in a cohort, for example, and now you found each other somehow, maybe people who weren't part of your cohort, but you found some kind of community. But how do you deal with the people who are in your discipline, okay, let's say in your case, political science, who seem utterly clueless, and I mean, and who are not even, would never risk anything for political change. But before they risk something for political change, they have to believe political change is necessary. So how do you work with them? Do you just um, ignore them, find your community, and say, let's be done with it and get out of here? Or do you find yourselves actually trying to engage in political debate with them and try to change how they see the world? Or <laughs> oh, that almost over me. <laughs> So I think for me, the strange thing about my trajectory at Chicago is I got in the, involved in the Gender Center first mm -hmm. and then applied to political science. So it's actually been very hard to sort of find a home in political science mm -hmm. now because I feel like I know this is my home. I know the people here. And on the question of space, there, we also don't have space for students in political science. So it's just easier to exist here and have a space. Um, but yeah, I think it has been very hard to translate what I do, even to cohort mates who are, and professors who are um, friendly to, because I always feel like I'm sort of saying, well, I think this is political science, but I'm not really sure. If you look at it this way, it might be. Um, so yeah, I think it is, it is very difficult. Um, and at the same time that the center has been a real benefit, it also makes me aware of how little I've been involved in the department. I mean, I know everybody and I go over there, but especially as I've gotten out of coursework, I don't really go to Pick Hall, except to the workshop. And that's kind of fine, but it's also sort of how do I identify as that as well as someone who does this kind of work. So. I mean, I was just going to say ditto. I mean, I think that the the gender studies workshop here was my first real intellectual community at the University of Chicago, and I think has continued to be the most important one to me. And ever since, um, you know, I, I don't find the English department hostile at all to the work I do. Um, I do think, though, that you know, it matters that it matters to me that like people show up for 
for things and for the spaces and communities that we're trying to create. And um, there are a lot of people in the English department, I'm talking about my peers who, you know, say like, oh yeah, like we get the sort of feminist thing, we get the, the queer theory thing, but like would never come, of course, to a gender and sexuality studies workshop. So they're not actually trying to show up in the same world with me. They're not trying to, you know, create a community. Um, and that, it, it really matters to me just that like people come to a workshop. Like I actually think that that is really important. And um, the, the only spaces in which people keep coming that I wanna be in are, are here. Um, so, I mean, I, I know that it, it is, I, I just wanted to echo something that Jen said too, that it is always upon the, you know, more marginalized um, people in, in a community to like do the work of brokerage and, and outreach. Um, and I understand that that's important and that, uh, you know, it is important to agitate and to be continuing to talk with our peers. Um, but sometimes it also is important just to develop the communities that you have and hope that other people will keep wanting to come if you really make it a good community. Can I, I'm, I want to address an aspect of your question that was really interesting to me but wasn't really involved in the question. Um, I'm thinking a lot about what you were saying about um, like student involvement in agitation, uh, particularly for faculty. Um, which, I, you know, I'm trying to think about that milieu and realizing that I really don't know anything about like what the process is like for faculty to be tenured here. And that strikes me as like really upsetting that I don't know anything about that as an, as an undergraduate. Uh, and so I like wonder what the possibilities are for coalition there between faculty, grad student, and undergrad, not even in the same department, just like as mm -hmm. people occupying the same space for being involved in that kind of agitation and maybe even like organizing in favor of of certain types of faculty and certain types of hiring practice. I'm like thinking of the Marlene Dixon um, like amazing hubbub as uh, a, like a really interesting example of that happening. Right in a different time period, admittedly, in the same way that Berkeley is maybe in a different time and space as our political <laughs> <laughs> mindset. But you know, it's also not that far, though. Like, you look at the work that the uh, Trauma Center Coalition was doing, a lot, a lot of students, grad students, and also alumni, which mm -hmm. was a really interesting, really effective strategy. Uh, and they're, like, getting what they want, and they're crossing boundaries uh, between these kind of different hierarchies of institutional affiliation. Uh, in such effective strategic ways. So that was a long way of saying I really liked your comment and I'm thinking that that's like fertile ground for something in the future. I think what's really interesting in your comment, Jean, too, is the assertion of a committee of sorts to be able to discuss, to discuss these processes assumes a stable understanding of tenure, right? Mm -hmm. It assumes that in a meeting we would be able to discuss what's, what tenure is as if it would apply to every human mm -hmm. who is approaching such a mark, right? And so part of that conversation actually has to unpack and detangle the processes that make tenure so successfully um, amorphous for some people. So can I speak to Linda's point really quickly about, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think for me, um, like as someone who tried to be an activist in undergrad and just failed miserably, um, not maybe not an organizer, I wasn't really good at it. Um, but, but I think, um, I think since, you know, I'm 31 now, and so I know I feel so old now, but um, <laughs> I think about how my, how my conception of, of, of being political and like agitation has changed over the last like 10 years. And for me, I think, you know, being from the Bay Area and having the Black Panther kind of, we have to go stump on the streets and we've got to go be outside and like, you know, um, it's changed for me because I found that a lot of ways, because my body is politicized in ways that sometimes I don't even mean for it to be, my mere presence in some spaces is very political. And I just think it's amazing. And so, like, I, I think back to uh, last year, I was asked if I, if I wanted an office on campus, and I said, no, I really want to be in Pick Hall because it really agitates some people. <laughs> <laughs> and the person's going to be like, oh. 
okay, <laughs> you know, but I think, I, I, I mean, I agree. I do think, I mean, and I'm a person who, like, you'll see me in the gender center, you'll see me in the race center, you'll see me here at, at search and events, but you'll also very much so see me prominently at other spaces on campus that I feel are hostile and violent to people who are typically not represented in those spaces. And, you know, I, I think that that's also very, very political and it is a, is a type of agitation. Um, and I, I, I also am like keenly aware with like you know self care and like being a an undergrad graduate student who has all these kind of burdens and financial concerns and all these other things going on and then having to you know be the change all the time and the stress of always having to be the change you know and so I think I I think what I've been trying to to do at least personally and also with like my social groups is we talk about these things we talk about where are we willing to put ourselves out there where are we willing to put ourselves at risk and where are we just not we're not going to do that right now or today maybe we'll do it next year or you know and there are so there are groups that are organizing we have the organization of black students we have a, another group that may be coming that maybe for grad students right and you know there are kind of these pockets where there are these political things happening but i also what i'm actually very like impressed by on this campus is that a lot of that stuff um is happening so consistently and building networks for for folks who typically don't have those networks, where they can feel they can go somewhere and just say, "Oh, I just really want to sit and talk about my hair. Let's talk mm -hmm. about hair, you know. Let's or be in a space where, hey, I just so I'm looking for this particular type of product. Where do you buy yours? Mm -hmm. You know, we have those conversations where it's like we get to talk about just these cultural things that we wouldn't get in these other kind of like you know more violent spaces. So I, I mean, I agree. There are times for agitation, absolutely, and. I I think the trauma center is a great example of that. I also think that there are little little moments of these kind of politics of public space that happen, and I think that they're amazing. And I I, I must say I volunteer for them like every day when I hang out in Pick Hall, and people are like, "Why does she have our stuff everywhere? She's wearing this shirt that says Negro or something." <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so I do it all the time, and I just think I think the agitation will look different at different moments, and I think it's important that we you know that we are able to participate. Um, you know, voluntarily in ways that, that work best for us in that moment of time. Do we have time for one more question? Oh, sorry, I just wanted to really put a plug in for the Graduate Students Union, which is um, has been tirelessly um, agitating for uh, labor, better labor conditions for non-tenured workers. And if undergraduates want to get involved, that would have a lot of clout with the administration because, um, for example, right now, um, right, your at least 50% of the core lectures are graduate students who don't make a lot of money, don't get health insurance, so on and so forth. Um, so um, any sort of undergraduate um, activism would be that's a whole new avenue, I think. And um, the GSU has been really trying to be um, a force for uh, interdisciplinary across all social sciences, humanities, and the STEM sciences to sort of fight for graduate students' rights. So um, I wanted to put that out there if you know uh, your undergraduate friends. Definitely. No, that's a great idea. Thank you all for joining